Welcome back to Murder Under the Midnight Sun. Thank you for joining me for this episode. I've got sort of a different type of episode tonight. It's historical, but it's also an amazing survival story. But before we get into that, I just had a couple of things to say at the top of the show. I think I mentioned it last time, but I want to do a listener episode for the two-year anniversary of when I started the show, which will be May 1st. So I'd love you guys to submit your stories of true crimes that you have either been obsessed with or that have affected you personally or just your hometown case that was all over the news. So you can either write those or you can record them and send them to me by April 15th. And you can send those to me at my email, which will be in the show notes. And if you have any questions, you can email me or send me a message on Facebook. I've gotten a couple so far, and I could always use more, though. So again, if you want to record, that's perfectly fine. But if you'd rather type it and have me read it out, then that's fine as well. As usual, this episode is brought to you by my Patreon supporters. Much love to Molly, who recently upgraded. If you would like to support the show on Patreon, simply click the link in the show notes. There are a variety of perks available, including goodies in the mail from me, and a variety of bonus episodes. I believe there are about six up at the moment, and I'm working on the next one right now. Well, not right right now, but you get the idea. And last thing before we get into the episode, I've got a promo for you guys. For those of you that can't get enough true crime, here's another true crime podcast for you to check out. Hello, my name is Michael Pritt, and I am the host of an all-new podcast called the True Crime Truckers Podcast. Every two weeks, I will be delving into a new case, some famous as well as some lesser known. Won't you join me as I take a look into the minds of madness? We can stare into the darkness together. You can find the show on iTunes as well as Stitcher. Just type in the True Crime Trucker Podcast. Join the Facebook group as well. Just search True Crime Truckers Podcast. Stay safe, everyone. So I hope you guys will check out his podcast. I've been binging it lately, and I'm really enjoying it. Also, he's a member of the same network as me, so he obviously has great taste. If you would like to have your promo at the top of the show, simply send it to me in an email, or you can message me on Facebook. With all that out of the way, let's get into the episode. On tonight's episode, I'll be discussing Leon Crane's Long Walk Home. And this is part one of a two-part story. I've always loved stories of survival. Humans staying alive when all hope seems long lost. I particularly enjoy survival stories that pit man against nature. Because with nature, there is no logic, no reasoning. And in the harshest environments, even the smallest decision can mean the difference between life or death. On tonight's episode, I've got a wartime survival story which saw one man face up against overwhelming odds, a man that looked death in the face and said, not today, good sir. So just a little backstory to lend context to this case. I found that many people, even Americans, don't know that there was actually boots on the ground combat on US territory during World War II. It was in Alaska which was not yet a state, but which was very much a part of the United States, and which saw American soldiers facing off against the Japanese, grappling for control of a territory that was extremely strategically significant. Now today's story is just one small event in that complicated situation, but I will definitely be going into much more depth about World War II in Alaska on a future series. In 1941, the U.S. government secretly created the Lend-Lease Program, 
which provided large amounts of wartime supplies, weaponry, planes, and ships to our allies. Because of our location, Alaska was a main hub for transfer of these items to the Soviet Union. During the four years this program was in play, the U.S. transferred supplies to the Soviet Union, valuing at more than $120 billion in 2019 dollars, including 8,000 planes. So there was quite a bit of air traffic in, out, and across Alaska. And there were many, many instances of military planes crashing in the wilderness, not to be found for decades, and sometimes never at all. I discussed one such crash on my New Year's Eve episode, and if you haven't, you definitely should give it a listen. Enter the hero of tonight's tale, Leon Crane. In 1943, the year of this story, he was six foot tall, muscular, 24 years old, born and raised in West Philadelphia. He was a first generation American, son of two Jewish immigrants who had escaped upheaval in the Ukraine and come to make their home in Pennsylvania just a few years before Leon was born. He grew up there with two brothers and a sister and a deep interest in aviation and mechanics. The family was on the lower end of the economic spectrum, but both parents worked and the family experienced a modest but happy lifestyle, even throughout the Depression. All of the children took music and Hebrew lessons. They were very well-rounded students. Leon's brothers went off to medical school, but as he grew up, he continued to have a fascination with mechanics and aerodynamics, and he was accepted to MIT where he became college buddies with Richard Feynman, who would go on to become a popular physicist, win a Nobel Prize, and work on the Manhattan Project. While Crane really wanted to be sort of on the mechanics and engineering side of aviation, he also decided to get a pilot's license while in college, which led to him getting involved in the military and eventually, not long after Pearl Harbor, he was called up to duty and stationed at Ladd Field in Fairbanks. The war was actually kind of personal for him and his family, since they had family and friends back home in the Ukraine who were greatly affected by the Nazi regime. Like most of the non-Alaskans stationed in Fairbanks during the winter, Leon was literally out of his element. Fairbanks is a really cold place with a December average temperature range from three Fahrenheit down to negative 22 Fahrenheit, it's the coldest US city. Being stationed in Fairbanks, Alaska could feel very remote from the reality of war. But in fact, the Japanese had already attacked Dutch Harbor, Alaska in June of 1942. And even though that was 1500 miles away from Fairbanks, more and more men had been stationed up at Ladd Field in the event of more attacks on Alaska. And even though it was very cold up there, many of the men felt very thankful that they weren't stuck in the many battles raging in the South Pacific heat. And again, pilots were always nervous about flying in the cold Alaskan weather that could cause havoc on airplanes, but they were constantly thankful that they didn't have to worry about being shot at. On the morning of December 21st, 1943, Leon Crane was running late to the hangar after a late night poker game and got there just after eight. That day, he was scheduled to be the co-pilot to second Lieutenant Harold Hoskin on the Iceberg Inez, a B-24 bomber. Also on board were Lieutenant James Seibert, Sergeant Ralph Wenz, and Master Sergeant Richard Pompeo. The five men weren't going on any sort of dramatic mission that day. They were actually just going out to do some tests on the aircraft systems in extreme cold weather. By 9.45, the plane was all checked out and they took off. A couple of hours later, they were around 70 miles away from Ladd Field when one of the plane's engines malfunctioned and put them into a spin at 25,000 feet. Both Crane and Hoskin desperately struggled to regain control of the plane to no avail. They kept spinning as the men tried to prepare themselves to bail out of the plane. It's worth noting that the B-24 was nicknamed the Flying Coffin because of its cramped interior 
and single exit at the back, making it hard to bail out in an emergency. Yet despite these drawbacks, it was an incredibly prolific aircraft during World War II. It was 70 below zero where the men were flying. So as they were trying to bail out, they also tried to gather any cold weather gear along with their parachutes in the chaos of the plane. Crane managed to bail out and engage his parachute. As he slowly drifted down, he watched the plane crash and burst into flame. He wasn't sure if anyone else had made it out. Once he landed on the ground and had gotten his bearings, he took stock of the situation. And then he tried to find the other men by shouting their names over and over, but there was no reply. He felt glad that he had made it to the ground in one piece, but didn't necessarily want to be alone. And since the plane had burned up all of the extra supplies, all that he had with him was what he had managed to grab. He had managed to grab most of his cold weather gear, but somehow he had forgotten to grab his mittens. At this cold of a temperature, it would be extremely easy to damage his hands irreparably with just a couple of minutes of exposure. So he knew he would have to watch for that. He felt relatively okay compared to what he had just gone through, but he really didn't know if anyone else had safely escaped the plane crash. And he wasn't really positive where he was. He hadn't really spent much time in the great outdoors and he didn't have the best grasp on Alaskan geography. At this point in time, he'd only been stationed at Ladd Field for a couple of months. He knew that Pompeo had previously survived a short stint stranded in the wilderness a few years prior, and he hoped that he had somehow survived the crash. He thought that the fellow Pennsylvanian had managed to parachute from the plane but it had all happened so fast that he couldn't be sure. However, of all the men that had been aboard, he most wished that Wens could have survived. He was the oldest of the group at 31, and Crane knew that he had much more outdoors experience than any of them. But he was almost certain that Wens had gone down with the plane, along with Seibert and Hoskin. Mostly he wished he wasn't alone in this overwhelming situation, but he forced himself to remain calm and try to focus on the positive aspects of the situation. He didn't really have any other supplies other than what he was wearing, which was enough to keep him warm other than his hands, but he did happen to have his personal folding knife on him, along with some matches. He didn't smoke, but he'd actually grabbed those for Hoskin on the way to the hangar that morning, but I'd forgotten to give them to him. He had grabbed two packages, which made for a total of 40 matches. It was a huge stroke of luck. Those tiny packets of matches would likely be one of the main instruments of his survival. He tried to figure out the best path forward for the situation. He knew that there would be a search party for the missing plane sooner rather than later, but that they wouldn't have the best idea of where to search because they had been unable to radio SOS and their location before crashing. And they had last spoken with air traffic control about an hour prior to the crash. Crane also remembered with some shock that their radio operator had not indicated their direction of travel during the last transmission. So it would be a massive range of search. He made it his first mission to try to be as easily found as possible by using large pieces of wood to write the letters SOS which would hopefully be easily spotted from above, standing out dark against the snow. Next, he quickly began to build the groundwork for a fire. Anyone that has ever read To Build a Fire by Jack London knows that being able to create a fire in that cold of weather is critical. And he had to do it while his hands were still working. It took several matches before he was finally able to start the fire using the only paper he had on him as kindling, which was a letter he had received that morning from his dad and had absentmindedly tucked into his pocket. With the fire secured and burning hot, he exhaustedly allowed himself to relax and rolled up in his parachute 
to get as much warmth as he could. He woke up in the light of morning and saw that he was near a frozen river, which, in his small knowledge of the local area, he believed might be the Charlie River, which was a tributary of the Yukon. After the night's rest, he felt ready to truly assess his situation. It was military protocol to stay with the plane and await for rescue, but he knew that it would be damn near impossible for the search planes to come across his location by chance. But he tried to stay positive, and he focused on the fact that he was by a river, which, if it was the river he thought it was, then he could theoretically follow it back towards some form of civilization. Unfortunately for him, his timing was terrible. The plane crash had occurred on winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. That far north, he could expect to have less than four, four hours of daylight at that time of the year, and he didn't relish walking in the dark. The terrain was made up of deep snow covering large rocks, and he knew that if he were to fall and hurt himself, he'd be as good as dead. He tried to focus on his immediate surroundings and what he could control. He decided to stay near the crash for at least a few days, up to a week. If he wasn't found by then, he knew that the search would probably have been called off, and at that point he would start walking. He gathered up as much wood as he could find to create a temporary haphazard shelter to try to get as much warmth as possible while he slept. He didn't truly expect the crash to be spotted. The debris was no longer sending any smoke into the air, and it would be extremely hard to randomly spot the broken plane against the snowy backdrop. The week passed by sluggishly. Leon spent most of the day curled up for warmth in his parachute. His only activities involved getting water and keeping the fire burning. There was nothing to eat but some squirrels that scampered through the trees, but he was too weak and slow to even catch one. Finally, after a week of this, he had to admit to himself that the search for the plane had likely been called off. He also assumed, and would later learn, that his parents had been notified of him being MIA. His heart broke for his parents, and he was terrified that he would die out there in the middle of nowhere, and that his family would never really know what had happened to him. He knew that if he were to just stay hunkered down in that spot, it would be a slow suicide. Though he wasn't positive about where he was in relation to civilization, he knew that he would have to start walking or die. He expected to die anyway, but figured he should at least try to survive. He decided to head west and use the sun as a guide. A week without food had affected not only his body, but his mind. His thoughts were foggy, but he knew enough to realize that one bad decision could cost everything. So he tried to stay as focused as possible as he packed up his meager belongings and began his long journey. He walked down the river directly on the ice, knowing it could be dangerous, but it was the fastest route. And after about a day and a half, he experienced what felt like a genuine miracle. Toward the end of the day, he came upon a large tent on a raised platform, covering a cache of supplies, including tools and food. But even better, he found a cabin. Inside the small building was food and a stove, and even some burlap he could use to wrap up and to sleep. He felt like he had won the lottery, as he was finally able to eat real food after eight days of starving. There were no people around to be seen, but the cabin did not feel abandoned. He felt as though someone had inhabited it rather recently and hoped that meant that there were more people nearby that hopefully had a radio he could contact the base with. The next day was New Year's Eve and he woke up feeling rested and satiated and buoyed by optimism. He decided to keep heading down the river, believing that there had to be a village somewhere nearby. As he trudged along hour by hour, his optimism slowly ebbed away until he realized it was likely near midnight and he had not seen another sign of civilization the whole day. It was the coldest night of his ordeal yet and he knew that it would be incredibly hard to start a fire. His fingers were not doing well 
and he did not trust them to be able to light a match. With a heavy heart, he made the terrible decision to turn around and head back to the cabin. A 30-hour round trip found him back where he had started in the light of late morning on January 1st, 1944. After a few days spent recovering, he checked out the cash on the platform again. There was one large container he had not looked into yet, and when he did, he was surprised to find snowshoes, a rifle, warm gear, including mittens, as well as a variety of other food. He couldn't believe his luck. He also found the name Phil Burrell on some of the items and assumed that was the cabin owner. The label also said Woodchopper, Alaska. He couldn't understand why someone had a cabin way out there, far away from anything, but was beyond thankful that he had found it. After making this discovery, he made the decision to take it easy for a while at the cabin, get his strength back with food and drink and sleep, and hopefully his hands would start to go back to normal. And then a storm came which kept him in the cabin even longer. He didn't leave again for another three weeks. While Crane was camping out at Burrell's cabin, back at Ladd Field, everyone was discussing the mystery of the missing plane. Hearing about plane crashes and malfunctions was a regular part of life for the men stationed there. But to hear about a plane that seemingly disappeared into thin air was another matter entirely. The search had ended on December 29th, but many involved in it still believed that the men could be alive somewhere, but stranded. But they just couldn't use any more resources to look for them. During Crane's days of rest, he dug around the cabin more and found a variety of other helpful things, including a map of Alaska where he could see Woodchopper, Alaska marked, which was where he assumed that he was, and it was indeed alongside the Charlie River. He decided that once the storm broke, he would take an exploratory journey with enough supplies for at least a couple of days. And that's where we will pick up on part two of this story. And I hope you guys are finding it as fascinating as I did. Until next time, good night.